Imagine exploring Italy with an art historian, or cruising Alaska's Inside Passage with a renowned geologist. When you travel with Smithsonian Journeys, you gain a deeper understanding of the world's fascinating places. Find a wide range of river cruises, classic land journeys, hiking trips, and more at smithsonianjourneys.org or by calling 855-330-1542. Your participation benefits the important work of the Smithsonian. Visit smithsonianjourneys.org slash podcast to request your free catalog. Here is a long, sad story. In the late 1800s, the U.S. government forced the Osage people off their land in Kansas and relocated them to what was called Indian Territory. This place is now the state of Oklahoma. The government put the Osage there because the land was thought to be worthless. But it turns out it had oil. Suddenly, many Osage families were wildly rich. White outsiders took notice of this wealth, and they wanted it. By the 1920s, the reign of terror had begun. Osage were cheated out of their money, and several dozen were murdered. The deaths were the subject of a major criminal investigation by a young government agency now known as the FBI. But most of the murders were either misreported or went unsolved. In the middle of all this, Henry Roan was born. Here's James Roan Gray, who goes by Jim. Henry was his great-grandfather. I'm not only the great-grandson of Henry Roan, my mom chose to name me Roan in my middle name, named after her little brother who died as an infant and named after her grandfather, who was murdered during that same decade. And so I grew up kind of carrying this story. This story is now a movie called Killers of the Flower Moon. The death of Henry Roan is part of the plot. It's directed by Martin Scorsese, based on a book by journalist David Graham. And it tells the story of the reign of terror and the subsequent FBI involvement. When Jim learned this would be a big budget Hollywood film, he was concerned. So was his entire community. It was collectively on our minds because nobody knew whether or not they were just gonna follow the same path that other movie makers have made when it came to making native theme movies. Jim Gray is a former chief of the Osage Nation. He was one of several Osage who reached out to Scorsese wanting him to hear their perspective on this story, which is how the following meeting happened between him and the filmmaker. We had a large receiving line of all the Osages that were in the room and he went through with his entourage and shook everybody's hand in the whole room, which probably took about 45 minutes <laughs> to do that because there was about 100, 150 of us in the room. Each one of us had a chance to say a few words. I had a few words to say about the fact that the three biggest movie blockbusters by the terms of your industry that had a native theme were Dances with Wolves, Last of the Mohicans, and Little Big Man. And all three of these stories have something in common. One is, is that they require a white person to tell the story and save the day. Two, they required a white writer to write a story of fiction. We'll find out later in this episode how this meeting entirely changed the focus of Killers of the Flower Moon. But it also got us thinking about the entire history of how Native Americans have been portrayed on film and who gets to tell the stories that become blockbusters. From Smithsonian Magazine and PRX Productions, this is There's More to That the show where we talk about the real stories behind Hollywood hits. On this episode, from old westerns to killers of the flower moon, what has changed? And why is it so important for us to find out? I'm Chris Klemek. Let's get started. The holidays are coming, and SmithsonianStore.com has gifts for everyone on your list. Find museum-inspired jewelry, home goods, clothing, books, toys, and more. Save 10% and get free shipping when you go to SmithsonianStore.com and enter the promo code PODCAST at checkout. All profits support the Smithsonian's mission. Remember to use code PODCAST when you shop SmithsonianStore.com today. Don't wait. Offer valid only for a limited time. New from Smithsonian Books, Space Shuttle Stories, First-Hand Astronaut Accounts from All 135 Missions, by NASA Astronaut Tom Jones. Experience all NASA Space Shuttle missions through the words of the astronauts themselves in this spectacularly illustrated volume with more than 600 photos from the NASA archives. 
This guide is perfect for fans of space history and space flight. Space Shuttle Stories is available wherever books are sold. Before we go back to Jim, let's take a second to talk about the history of Native Americans in the movies. Sandra Hale Shulman recently wrote about Native American representation in Hollywood for Smithsonian Magazine. Sandra is part Cherokee and also a film producer herself. Going back to the 50s, there was a slew of movies made, particularly with John Wayne, um, that were just, you know, horrible representation and just showing natives as hostiles and savages and, and just people to be attacked and wiped out. The White Savior and the Manifest Destiny, which outlined that, you know, th this is what's going to happen. The white people, the Europeans and the settlers are going to move across the country. This is what's meant to happen and nothing's going to stand in their way. And it turned into a just a mass genocide. So and the films were reflecting that. <laughs> it's just staggering they got away with that and nobody questioned it for a really long time. And not only were narratives like this pervasive, but it was also rare to see an actual Native American actor in a Native American role. Most of the Natives were played by Italians. <laughs> okay. And they were just putting makeup and wigs on them. And, you know, their excuse was, well, there were no Native actors available. Well, that's not true. They just were simply not looking for them or letting them in in the films. Sandra said that eventually things started to shift in a slightly better direction during the civil rights movement. The consciousness raising really started in the 60s. I think it had to do with the Voting Rights Act. They gave everyone the right to vote, which they shockingly didn't have. African Americans and Native Americans did not have that right for a long time. When they finally got that, it changed the game. Because when you get voting rights, then you have power. And then you can start demanding civil rights, and that led into the protests in the 60s. And then I think the film representation changed around in the 70s. The awareness of what was going on with minorities across the board needed to be reflected in entertainment and in film. An early movie that I, I remember seeing when I was young that really made an impression was Soldier Blue. Good, brave lads, coming out here to kill themselves a real live engine, putting up their forts in a country they've got no claim to. So what the hell do you expect the Indians to do? Sit back on their butts while the army takes over their land? You saw for yourself. Soldier Blue had Candace Bergen and Peter Strauss, and she plays a woman that was adopted by a Cheyenne tribe when she was orphaned and gets involved with Peter Strauss, who's a soldier, and he comes to see the horrors of what the army is doing through her eyes. That was a big turning point. And then Little Big Man was another big one with Dustin Hoffman, which had some great native actors in it, but it was kind of played as a black comedy. Got to cut your throat to get it through your head. I'm a white man. White? Sure I'm white. Didn't you hear me say, God bless George Washington. God bless my mother. I mean, now what kind of Indian would say a fool thing like that? They tended to turn these really horrific scenes into humor. It's a strange film. One of the biggest hits based on Native American subject matter came in 1990. It was Dances with Wolves, directed by and starring Kevin Costner. And, you know, again, kind of complicated. I think Costner did certainly have all the right intentions. The fierce one, as I call him, seems a very tough fellow. I hope I never have to fight him. From the little I know, he seems to be honest and very direct. I like the quiet one immensely. He's been patient and inquisitive. He seems eager to communicate. He used really great Native actors. Floyd Red Crow Westerman played the chief. But again, it's kind of the white savior story in a way. And they don't go all the way with a interracial love story because he falls for a white woman that was adopted into the tribe. Yeah, I mean, that's um, kind of why I want to talk about some of these movies. Yes, they're, they're taking Native people seriously enough to take care to depict their language correctly and, and clothes and set design and things, but still centering their stories around white stars. Well, but these are movies being made by white directors with white leads. Do you, do you feel like Killers of the Flower Moon is, is a step in the right direction in terms of Native representation? Oh my gosh. Well, it sets the bar so high. 
Um, I think, unfortunately, for future filmmakers who do not have pockets that deep, it's going to be a challenge uh, because I think they're going to get called out on it. I mean, they had an enormous budget to do this. It shows. It shows on the screen. In other films, they'll bring in a consultant or an advisor or two in the beginning and say, is this what they looked like? Is this what they would have worn? And then the consultants are gone. They're not there on the set. They're not there in the filming. They're not involved in editing. Uh, This level of involvement was start to finish. So that's a big difference. To find out how this was possible, let's go back to Jim Gray and his great-grandfather, Henry Roan. The real-life Henry Roan spent much of his childhood in a government-run boarding school in Pennsylvania. It was a military barracks, and uh, they burned his clothes when he got off the train. They cut his hair. They beat him and all Indian kids for speaking their language or practicing their traditional ways. And unfortunately, he was sent to live there for years, deprived of an Osage upbringing, deprived of an Osage community to support him growing up. And so years later, as a teenager, when he returned, he didn't really fit into the white society because he was an Indian. He didn't really fit into the Indian world because he wasn't raised Indian. When I try to describe my great grandfather's short existence, and half of it was spent being in the turmoil of that boarding school experience. The last half was trying to find a place that he felt at peace in, and he never did find it in the later in life. He had marriages that didn't work out. One of them was to Molly, and that was an arranged marriage that didn't stick. That's Molly Burkhart? Molly Burkhart, yeah. Molly Burkhart is a main character in Killers of the Flower Moon, played by actress Lily Gladstone. In the movie, she's married to Ernest Burkhart, played by Leonardo DiCaprio. But she had a brief marriage before that to Henry Roan. There are very few family stories about his life that I wish I could tell you, but I, unfortunately I can't because history has robbed us of that. The only thing I have to rely on is the FBI investigation that basically classified him as a drunk Indian who had it coming to him. And I reject it because I know this other part of the history and very few Native American children who did survive that period of time did have a good experience in that system. And unfortunately, his life, you know, didn't turn out the way he had wanted, unfortunately. And uh, as a result, he was in the wrong crowd. And the this uh, guy named William Hale, who orchestrated all these killings, saw value in his death and had him killed. William Hale was the orchestrator of Henry Roan's death and of other murders during the Reign of Terror. But his relationship with crime didn't start or end there. In Killers of the Flower Moon, he's played by Robert De Niro. William Hale was larger than life. Um, He was friends with everybody. He was a cattleman. He spoke Osage. He ingratiated himself in the community. You know, they say the devil doesn't show up with horns and a tail. He shows up smiling, charismatic, very uh, approachable. William Hale called Henry Rohn his friend. And told investigators that he had what they called melancholy. And the melancholy was caused by the sadness. The seed was planted in his head by Hale himself, who told anybody who would listen to him that his wife was cheating on him with another man and not feeling in terribly confident whether or not that was true or not, he went to drink. And the person who provided him the alcohol was William Hale. And eventually, in one of these drunken trips out in the country, he had a hired gun take him out in the country, and while he was drunk, shoot him in the back of the head. Over time, these kinds of killings became more commonplace. But there were no answers and no accountability. Osage just could not find justice with the local law enforcement. And as time went on, the tribe would hire private investigators to look into it. Families did as well. None of them got anywhere. Nobody would talk. There was fear in the environment of doing anything that would offend William Hale. Uh, He had a reputation for being pretty shrewd. Those who challenged him didn't uh, fare well. 
And there was also a system of just everybody was in on it. It wasn't just killing ill sages. It was marrying into the tribe. It was overcharging them at stores, getting them in debt, taking their land to clear debt. And this practice went on and on and on. Eventually, members of the community decided to seek help from the federal government. The Bureau of Investigation was a relatively new agency back then. It was led by J. Edgar Hoover, who at the time wasn't even 30 years old. The Osage murders presented Hoover with an opportunity. He was looking for something that would raise the profile of the Bureau. At the time, it was a little-known Bureau within the Department of Justice. And so as uh, time went on, the Osages passed the hat, as it were, and raised $20,000 in 1920s monies, which was close to $300,000 today, to entice the investigators to come in. And now, setting aside the, you know, nobody should have to pay the Bureau to investigate a crime, right? But but these were different days, right? And so this is what the tribe did. That's how that investigation got started. And I think that, you know, when you look at it from that point of view, it's it's not a stretch, if you will, to suggest that Native people were not seen as equal to other Americans, not in society and not in the law. Jim would hear bits of stories about this period of time throughout his childhood. When he got older, he decided he wanted to learn more for himself. He got his hands on a copy of a book called The Deaths of Civil Bolton by reporter Dennis McAuliffe. Here, he learned about the extent of the reign of terror for the first time. So I read that book and I came home one day and I talked to my mom about it. and. Uh, I asked her if um, if she had read the book, and she said, yeah. And I said, well, there's a, there's a passage in that book that he says, not all the murders that took place were investigated by either the state, local government, or by the feds. And she goes, yeah, I read that. And I said, well, Mom, how many, I mean, correct me if I'm wrong, but didn't Grandpa Gray and Grandma Gray on my dad's side also pass away during that period of time? She said, yeah. And your your mom, she passed away during that time? She said, yeah. And, you know, your little brother, who was an infant, also died in that time? She said, yeah. And she didn't, she didn't elaborate. If she had theories of her own, she didn't. You didn't share it. And and I and I think it speaks to a period of time that even after the FBI got their headlines and got their convictions, they all left. But the killings continued to go on, Chris. And a lot of Osages just stopped talking about it. That entire generation didn't even talk about it for decades. Jim also pointed out that while the Osage were facing a reign of terror, a neighboring community was simultaneously facing their own violent backlash. The 1921 Tulsa Race Massacre was a 24-hour siege wherein an armed white mob decimated an affluent black district of Tulsa, Oklahoma. It's estimated that as many as 300 people may have been killed in this attack. Jim speaks about this connection often. I think it just talks about how the world saw people of color. These are two marginalized groups by society, generally speaking. Um, But... Both had become fantastically wealthy in their own way. Um, The North Tulsa community was a prosperous black district. They managed to create their own businesses and stores, their own real estate companies, their own banks, their own newspaper. They were able to be independent of reliance on anybody else but their own community. And they were able to draw investment from all around the area into their banks and those dollars that those banks had invested right back into their, their families and their communities and their, to start businesses of their own. So the community just prospered in an unbelievable way that was somewhat shocking for its time, because we're talking about Jim Crow, the rise of the KKK throughout the South and this part of the country as well. And this was happening at the same time, the Osages, had found oil on their land and oil and gas development was going crazy during that period of time. 
World War One was going on, and they needed oil to run the machinery of the war. So there was an enormous desire for the United States to capture as much oil as they could. And these companies like Sinclair, Conoco, J.P. Morgan, they all got their fortunes in drilling during this period of time. And their presence is still felt in the city of Ponca City, Bartlesville, Oklahoma, and Tulsa, which are all border towns to the Osage Nation. These industries all made their money, made their mark drilling Osage oil. And so these two events were happening simultaneously. The, the first reported death in the Osage Raid of Terra was, was identified on May 21st, 1921. By the end of that week, the Tulsa Race Massacre started. And these two events happened the same week, 40 miles apart. Wow. I never learned about the Osage murders or the Tulsa Race Massacre in high school or in college. You know, I found about these things as an adult, which is, it seems shocking to me. I mean, what does this tell you about whose stories we think of as worth telling and and educating kids about in, in this country? It just shows you that this country has a lot of work to do to hold itself accountable on how it became the country that we now call America today. I think there are people like me who know our story and have taken time to educate myself, but I know that I did not learn that in school. Um, I went to a small high school in Pahasco, Oklahoma, where the headquarters of the Osage Nation is located. They didn't even talk about it. I had a high school teacher, uh, Oklahoma history teacher, He's an old gentleman. His name was Mr. Burton, real kind man. And um, I remember this to this day because I've been thinking about it a lot lately. I was a sophomore or junior, and we all got into class in our seats. And he told us to put our books down, put our pencils down. I'm going to tell you a story. Don't worry, you don't have to take notes because you're not going to be tested on it because I'm not really allowed to teach this. And he sat down for that whole hour and he told us the story of the Trail of Tears of how the Cherokees had fought to hold on to their land and had fought with General Jackson when he was a soldier and saved his life in uh, the previous war in uh, 1812, I think. The Cherokees were nothing but an ally and friend of the United States and were dubbed the term the civilized tribes, you know, at the time. I don't think the Cherokees care for that term, but that's what the country referred to them, you know. Right, right. They're good Indians, you know, and they use the institutions of this government to defend themselves from being moved off their land. They sued and they won and it was appealed and it went to the Supreme Court and the U.S. Supreme Court ruled in favor of the Cherokees. And President Jackson said the court has made its decision, now see them enforce it. So basically, he defied a U.S. Supreme Court decision, and they forcibly removed the Cherokee people from the southeast part of the country to Indian Territory at Bayonet Point. And that story he told us in high school happened on this land that we're in Oklahoma. And um, because the Cherokees were moved to eastern Oklahoma and where they had to reestablish themselves, But in the process of that removal, they lost one fourth of their population through death and starvation and and through the bitter colds of the winter, they froze to death along the way. That's why it's called the Trail of Tears. And so he took time to tell that story in high school, but he wasn't allowed to teach it. Jim was busy working on a project about the Reign of Terror when he heard Martin Scorsese would be making Killers of the Flower Moon into a movie. This was January 2017. With Scorsese signing on to be the director, it became obvious this was going to get a lot of national and international attention. That was both exciting for the Osages, but it was also very nerve-wracking because at that point, we didn't know what kind of movie they were going to make. And so myself and other Osages that were paying attention to this story started talking in our own community about 
the need for agency, the need for some kind of voice in this story. They're talking about our family members here. In October 2019, Jim got together with other descendants of victims from the conspiracy against the Osage. They decided to write a letter to Scorsese asking him to come visit them in Oklahoma. And he responded and said, yes, I will come. And then Scorsese arrived. He literally had an entourage with him. <laughs> of people who had worked on all his films going back 20, 25 years. Set designers, location people, people that work on the technical side of the film. One of the executive producers was there, but he said no press. And so it wasn't covered. He didn't want this to be a photo op. This was sitting down, let's roll up our sleeves and let's talk. Eventually, it was Jim's time to speak. And it was nervous. I mean, I was sitting here talking to Mr. Scorsese, and I'm only eight feet away from him from a microphone in front of 100 plus Osages in a room. And, and, and I was a little, you know, starstruck, I guess is the right word, but I didn't want him to leave empty handed. I wanted to challenge him. And I, I said, listen, the people in this room are descendants of the people in this book. David Grant did an excellent job of writing the accurate history of what happened in those killings. But the Osage way of life, the Osage cosmology are not in the book, but they're in this room. And I said, nobody in here wants you to fail. We want you to get it right. And we want to help you if you let us. And we want you to make the movie that this industry has never made before. Hmm. The future people in this film industry are going to look at it and say, that's the one we got right. Be the director to make that film. And the whole room just went up in applause and war hoops and Lulu's and his eyes got really big and he leaned in to his entourage and they all started whispering together and he jumped out of his chair and he shook my hand and he took the mic and uh, he said that I've learned a lot from listening to you all and I want to take some time to postpone production to give myself time to write this story right. And I don't want to start it until I do. Wow. And um, he made that promise right then and there. Yeah. So so he, he wasn't at all, you know, defensive or... Well, the, it's Scorsese, right? This isn't, uh, you know, a Victorian movie of polite society. He did say, look, there's a way to tell this story that brings the humanity of the Osages into this picture. And I think I could work on it and I can make it better. But I also want you to know this is a violent story. And I'm not going to leave the violence out. I don't think you can tell this story without the violence, to be honest, because it is a hopefully a teachable moment for people who have, like you said before, have not made it a, a cause to document enough to teach in our public schools that this actually happened. Scorsese's original screenplay was centered around Tom White, the FBI agent tasked with investigating the Osage murders. Leonardo DiCaprio would have played this character in the film's original conception. But after this big meeting and Scorsese's pledge to revise the script, another big thing happened. He was going to start production in March of 2020, which we all know what happened in March of 2020. The pandemic probably had as much to do with giving him the time to rewrite these characters and recast these stars into these new roles with the script to go with it, he wouldn't have been able to do that in a matter of weeks, which is his original plan. But when the whole world shut down, it included the movie industry, and nothing was being made for months. That unfortunate event actually gave Scorsese and his team time to rewrite the script. And he did it in a way that basically changed the direction of the film. And then once the story started up again, it caused other things to happen. By the time they came back to shoot, there was an entire infrastructure that the tribe had already established that was ready to teach the actors Osage. Oh, wow. That was ready to sit down with the costume designers and show them how the Osages dressed in the 1920s. 
what their homes looked like in the 1920s. And there were set designers who were Osage, artists that were Osage, craftspeople, painters, electricians, people of all different trades had come in. Heck, even the the guy who got the catering contract, who was a Chicago-based trained chef who moved home to be with his mom in Pahuska, got the contract to provide food for everybody on the set for eight months of filming. I mean, it was an amazing collaboration that I was just blown away. They could have just put a bunch of non-Osages in these roles speaking Lakota, you know, or Navajo or some other tribal language because the white audience sitting there wouldn't know if they were speaking Osage. When they had the casting calls, all these Osages showed up to appear as extras and other, you know, limited speaking roles that were in the film. When you watch the movie, you see a lot of Osages in the in the film, in the foreground, in the background. You see the shots of location. You see the landscape of the Osage lands. You see the way the Osages talked, even in English. There was an Osage broken English kind of cadence that you would not have picked up if you didn't shoot it here. Those little things may escape a normal moviegoer, but to an Osage, they would say, wow, our culture is really present in this film. And uh, that's due to Scorsese deciding he wanted that. So I want to ask you about your opinion of the film. What did you think of it? I would say my expectations were met and exceeded by how much Osage culture and language is present in the film. It was my biggest takeaway that they didn't just teach these non-Osage actors and actresses Osage. They taught the white actors and actresses Osage. And their Osage was as good as anybody speaks it today. And the way they shot the scenes involving an Osage funeral and Osage weddings and even the Osage council meeting was all done with reverence and accuracy. It didn't have to go down that way. I know it didn't. 1920s Osage Nation came to life in this film in a way that I can't really put it in words. What was it like to see a dramatization of a story that involved your ancestor very, very directly? I mean, you're not just an Osage leader. You are a no. blood relative of one of these victims of these murders. And when I saw that the book had come out and I knew that there was going to be a movie made of it, that was back in 2017. I basically had six years to mentally think this moment through because I knew there's no way they're going to be able to tell that story without showing his murder. And I was right. They did show his murder. But I'm glad that, that it did not become the bloodbath that I feared it might. Scorsese didn't go that route. He 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 didn't leave the violence out. Like he said, He it's in there. You know, it just wasn't glorified. Do you want people to see this movie? Yeah, I think everyone should see it. It's important to know that this isn't just my family story. It's not just my tribe story. It's an American story. So for anybody who's not Osage watching this, whether they're Indian or non-Indian or any people of color, or whatever, you know, there's an aspect of this story that they're going to connect with. Colonization, Manifest Destiny, Doctrine of Discovery, all these terms that have been used to justify the wholesale taking of a continent. Not just North American continent, but South America, Africa, Asia, other countries in the Middle East have all have a connection to colonialism and its impact. It's possible that this story would resonate with an audience of such a universal nature. I think it might. For Americans' sake, it's important for you to know your own story, just like it's important for me to know mine. Thank you so much for talking to us at such length and in such detail. Chief Gray, this has been a, a fascinating conversation. Thank you for inviting me. I'm glad to be here.
To read Sandra Hale Shulman's article about Native representation on film, head to smithsonianmag.com. You'll also find a link in our show notes. We like to end each episode with a little extra something fun from my colleagues here at Smithsonian Magazine. The dinner party fact. It's just a small conversation starter you can bring to your next supper club. Although, as you'll hear, this week's fact may be better at breakfast. Hi, my name is Malin Sully, and I'm the online history editor at Smithsonian Magazine. While researching a story on the impending departure of the National Zoo's pandas, I learned that Xing Xing, a male panda who arrived in DC in 1972, had a surprising sweet tooth. Everyone knows that pandas love bamboo, but later in life, Xing Xing took a shine to blueberry muffins, which keepers use to give him pills. He wouldn't settle for just any kind of muffin. He demanded ones from Starbucks. Thankfully, the coffee chain agreed to donate the necessary baked goods. There's More to That is a production of Smithsonian Magazine and PRX Productions. From the magazine, our team is me, Deborah Rosenberg, and Brian Wally. From PRX, our team is Jessica Miller, Genevieve Sponsler, Adriana Rosas Rivera, Rye Dorsey, Edwin Ochoa, and Josie Holtzman. The executive producer of PRX Productions is Jocelyn Gonzalez. Our episode artwork is by Emily Lankowitz. Fact checking by Stephanie Abramson. Our music is from APM Music. I'm Chris Clement. Thank you for listening.